Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation, which is called International Partnerships, Making Connections Between Your Garden and the World, or the APJ Conference. My name is Anthony Allison, or Tony Allison. I'm the coordinator of international education exchanges for an organization called EarthCore, based in Seattle, and I'll talk about that more a bit later. The part of the presentation that I'm giving is Botanical Gardens and International Environmental Education Exchanges and focus on this 10-year exchange program between the U.S. Pacific Northwest and Eastern Russia. I will be followed, I'm going to give a history of the exchange, how it was put together and what its uh, benefits are and some of the problems facing it. Then uh, Svetlana Sizikh from Irkutsk. Uh, Botanical Garden in Russia will be speaking about the exchange from her perspective. And then last, uh, Kate Sorensen from Bellevue Botanical Garden near Seattle will be speaking about the exchange from the perspective of her garden. <clears throat> so I thought I'd start with a little bit of geography so you know where these places are. We work with five different gardens now in the eastern half of Russia, stretching from Tomsk in Western Siberia, all the way to Sakhalin Island off the Pacific coast of Russia. And that's quite a distance. I believe it's um, four time zones. And as you probably know, Russia is the largest country in the world. So even dealing with just the Eastern half covers a lot of uh, geography. I wanted to talk about the origins of the exchange to go back to the exchange, for the exchange, uh, a bit of personal background I was involved uh, for many years in a joint Russian-American fishing company. And uh, I spent time on the boats, um, like this shot shows, but I also lived in Russia for a total of about five years, a good piece of that in Eastern Russia. So later on when I became an environmental educator and wanted to uh, start an international exchange, I turned to that part of the world where I had lived and knew people and uh, wanted to give something back to that uh, area as well. We started in 2009 with a visit to Vladivostok just to discuss the idea of an exchange with Vladivostok Botanical Garden. So here we are entering the garden, and this is the largest of the five gardens we deal with. And I'll talk about Vladivostok itself in just a minute. Um, as you see, the garden is gated. That's typical for a Russian bot botanical garden. So you buy a ticket as you enter and then um, uh, this particular garden is over 400 acres, uh, with 80% of it in uh, native forest. And um, so Atlanta is going to talk quite a bit about her garden. I think you can use that as an example of what uh, of, of Russian botanical gardens and um, how they're set up and what they feature. Vladivostok itself uh, is about the same size as Seattle, 600,000 people, um, about 4,000 miles from Moscow, and it's in a, a province uh, similar to our state called a maritime province or Primorsky Krai. It's called the San Francisco of Russia by some people and you can see why. It's very hilly and attractive and a uh, port city of course. Uh, now quite modern with cruise ships calling in and you can see already that it's got many historical artifacts as well as the uh, motion and uh, activity of a modern city. It, uh, it is uh, on the water. There are numerous bays and inlets that sort of divide the city up. And this is a suspension bridge built just eight years ago uh, that connects the city together. So I just want to give you a little bit of sense of a lot of a stock. After we agreed on trying this exchange as an experiment, we were able to get uh, raise money and uh, get a grant to bring three young Russian botanist educators from Vladivostok Botanical Garden to Seattle in 2010. So this was our first um, attempt to really run the exchange. We set up uh, meetings and observations and discussions with many different environmental education organizations in the Seattle area. And Seattle's a particularly rich area for this with um, a fairly long history of 
running environmental education programs. I highlighted Bellevue Botanical Garden because Kate's gonna be speaking later. And that was one of our first um, partners in the sense that they supported the program, hosted the Russian visitors. Um, and Kate will talk more about that in her, her uh, discussion. Uh, you might notice that University of Washington Botanical Gardens is also on the list. They've been very helpful and supportive um, for us running these exchanges. And in fact, that's where I uh, worked as an environmental educator for many years. The next year, we traveled to Russia, three of us, um, one person from UWBG Botanic Garden, one from Mountain Sound Greenway, another environmental organization that I worked for for a time. So these two were my bosses. And in 2011, in the summer, we went to, to uh, Vladivostok. And down below, you can see uh, three of the Russian botanist educators, our partners, and then you can see a bunch of the great thing about that trip was we got to work directly with Russian children and demonstrate environmental education techniques. We actually were also in several conferences with um, Russian educators and teachers. Uh, we were on TV at one point uh, and in the newspapers, so it was, it was kind of a big deal. But we got out away from Vladivostok to some more remote areas, and you can see in the lower couple of pictures there, we're out. Uh, and uh, in the lower right side, we're demonstrating a game called uh, the Web of Life, which you're probably familiar with, uh, which we demonstrated several times and has caught on now and is played often at botanical gardens in Eastern Russia when uh, they have programs for kids there. The following year, 2012, two U.S. educators from Islandwood, and Islandwood is probably the most well-known and renowned environmental education organization in the Pacific Northwest, just outside of Seattle. Uh, these two traveled to Vladivostok and while they were there, now this is the third year of the exchange, uh, the, the Vladivostok Botanical Garden with their support set up a week of environmental education. Uh, the theme was invisible thread and that, um, week of environmental education with um, kids coming in from all around the, the uh, province is still running uh, to this day. And when we go over in the summer, we often time our visits to take part in that. 2013, two more uh, botanist educators from Bottomstock came to the Seattle area. And I wanna mention that these educators during this period and for most of our history with them are really a full-time um, botanists who do research and care for their garden and they do environmental education sort of as an extracurricular activity when they can find the time to fit it in. The management has been uh, sympathetic and supportive but only recently have they hired full-time educators at some of our partner gardens. One of the highlights of our involvement has been Rhododendron Day, which is an event that they had going before we uh, first came over there. Uh, the rhododendron is the city flower of Vladivostok. They have several native rhododendrons, just as we do in our state. It's a state flower of the state of Washington. And on this day, uh, for this day, the um, kids in the surrounding area create works of art on a botanical theme that changes every year. And they bring their drawings in and the drawings are looked at, compared, awards are given. It's quite a large event. And we were able to start having US kids from the Seattle area participate, but of course they couldn't show up with their drawings themselves. So they um, put them into PowerPoints and the example in the bottom row there are some of their drawings. And uh, they were shown on the screen at the celebration on Rhododendron Day in Vladivostok and then the Russian organizers would send these um, sort of certificates, awards to the kids and they're here they are holding them up in their classroom in the Seattle area. Very excited um, to learn not only botany and science, but also something about geography, another culture um, and even history. So we've been doing that every year with usually two or three different Seattle schools, um, Seattle area schools involved. 
And uh, for an example, this year, the theme was a garden in my life. And this is the invitation or part of the invitation that was sent out. Unfortunately, this year, because of COVID-19, it's the first year that the, because school wasn't in session, the Seattle various schools were not able to participate, start that up again. And if you happen to know of a school in your area who would like to participate in this, um, please get in touch with me. And uh, my email address will be uh, on at the end of the presentation. In 2016, we were so um, pleased with the way the exchange had gone and how much benefit it was bringing to both sides. And we had a lot of testimony to that effect from the uh, Lateral Stock Botanical Garden that we decided to reach out to two more botanical gardens in Eastern Russia, one in the city of Irkutsk and one in Yuzhno Sakhalinsk. And you can see the geography there. Um, Irkutsk is right near Lake Baikal, the most famous lake in Russia, the largest lake in the world. And um, Svetlana will be talking, she's from Irkutsk, so she'll be talking more about that area and their garden. And we'll get to Sakhalin in more detail in just a minute. I wanted to mention Earth Corps because 2016 is when we partnered, began partnering with them as our fiscal sponsor. And that has been a tremendous help because uh, they have a lot of international experience. Um, they have been the structure through which we have applied for and received grants. And they also are involved in forest restoration, which is a form of environmental education that our groups have always benefited from. And they have an international program as well as a domestic US program. In the domestic US program, uh, young people, women and men ages about 20 to 28, come for one year to the Seattle area to be trained in um, environmental restoration and leadership skills. The International Corps members are carefully selected from around the world. There have been several from Russia and the former Soviet Union. So this is our, our partner Earth Corps and, and very important to our success. Irkutsk, I just wanted to show one picture which is um, shows the entrance to the Irkutsk Botanical Garden. Irkutsk is famous for its wooden carvings on buildings. It's sort of a tradition there and they um, use that in designing the front of their garden here. And we are uh, meeting Svetlana for the first time and you'll meet her in just a minute. And the man with the beard is from the U.S. Consulate in Vladivostok, who came to see uh, our activities. They have been very helpful to us uh, with procuring visas for visitors from Russia coming to the U.S. And one year we were able to get a grant uh, through them from the U.S. government to support our exchange. So that's been an, another important relation, relationship for us. U.S. Consulate in Vladivostok. From Irkutsk, after we agreed with Svetlana that we would pursue the exchange with her botanical garden, um, I traveled to Sakhalin Island off the east coast of Russia. You can see the geography better now, just above Japan and very close to um, North Korea and South Korea and China as well. It's a very interesting island, um, about 600 miles long, about 50 miles wide in its widest spot. And uh, in the lower right, you can see uh, that there is Japanese architecture there, and that is remaining from the Japanese period of 1900 and 1945, when Japan controlled the southern half of the island. And that's actually the Regional History, History Museum now, um, the uh, Japanese-style building. We, we held meetings with the uh, deputy director of the Botanical Garden for a couple of days. Uh, she was very enthusiastic, uh, talked to the rest of the staff, and they joined the exchange as well in September 2016. We finished up with another meeting in Vladivostok, and uh, we decided with all the, the three gardens to sign a protocol of understanding. And this is a kind of important step because it's not legally binding, but it set out our intentions to be clear that, that all sides understand the same way what, what our plans were going forward. So it laid it out in this um, protocol that we signed in 2016. And we've actually ended up following it quite closely, although if we agreed to, to um, 
diverge from the protocol, we certainly could. So the first group that involved all three gardens came in September 2017, and here they are. Uh, the lower left there, they're at but, um, Bellevue Botanical Garden. But similar to that first group I showed you, they visited well, probably 15 or so different organizations in the Northwest. And uh, they, they actually went into a school to see kids learning about the environment in the school as well as in the field. Most of the lessons they saw were in the field. And they also learned a great deal about uh, volunteers and how to train and maintain volunteers. Um, both environmental education itself and work with volunteers is really been at a fairly early stage in Russia, particularly when we first got involved with these gardens. And um, that's where they have made uh, huge steps forward in both uh, expansion and improvement of, of environmental education programs and uh, in their volunteer programs. And they to a volunteer event and participated, so uh, they had to get their hands dirty, and here they are removing um, invasive ivy uh, at an Earth Corps volunteer event during their stay. In 2018, three of us went to all three of our partner cities or botanical gardens, and what we do when we go over there primarily is evaluate the programs, which is very important to be able to measure our success and figure out how we need to adjust our programs. It's also very important in um, uh, reporting to our funders who want to see what we've been doing, what, what our results are. We also demonstrate uh, techniques of environmental education. We publicize environmental education. As I mentioned, sometimes we're on TV, we're in um, um, local newspapers and uh, on websites. And that's one of our goals to publicize environmental education. We also participate in seminars and conferences and um, exchange ideas with our Russian colleagues. Um, Svetlana is going to talk more about this, but she put on, uh, the, their garden in, in Irkutsk put on a fairly large scale environmental education conference um, hosted by their botanical garden. And four of us from the US came and we were able to get funding to bring the Russian botanist educators from other botanical gardens that we work with to Irkutsk. So that was quite an important sort of milestone event for the exchange and I think also for environmental education in Eastern Russia. And also another very important event in 2018 was uh, attending the uh, International Congress for Environmental Education, which was organized by BGCI, which uh, Botanical Gardens Conservation International, which you're probably familiar with, the International Organization for Botanic Gardens. And every several years, three or four years, they have a this kind of environmental education conference, very large scale in Warsaw, Poland, with 47 countries represented. And we were able to get funding for me to go there with uh, three of our partners from Botanical Gardens. We made a presentation about our exchange, which at that point was several years along and um, several other rep representatives of gardens who were at the conference approached me and asked if it would be possible for us to begin working with them. And as a result, uh, we've now begun working with Ukraine through the contacts we made at the conference. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Here's um, Another thing that happened in 2018, two more gardens from Eastern Russia joined the exchange. So those, these are our newest uh, participants. And you saw the slide at the beginning, I just highlighted Tomsk and Blagoveshensk, our two nearest, newest members. And when I say members, I just want to mention there's nothing, again, legal uh, or very um, highly documented about that. It's just an ongoing partnership that uh, we adjust from year to year. Lagoveshensk is a smaller town, smaller city uh, than Vladivostok or Irkutsk, 220,000. It's right on the border with China, just across the Amur River. And a very interesting, uh, beautiful place, quite a bit of Chinese influence, and a uh, very attractive botanical garden on the edge of the city. This is 
older uh, in terms of its uh, settlement by Russians. Uh, it's actually one of the oldest cities in Siberia, in eastern Russia, and has the first university there. So it's a city of students and, and uh, professors, and um, their botanical garden is actually accessible without going through a gate. It's the only one. Uh, and we um, have had a, a great uh, time working with the folks from Tom so far. So 2019, just last year, uh, in March and early April, we had a group of six educators representing five gardens in the Seattle area. Again, a very intensive visit with a lot of um, visits to different organizations. We also made presentations. I think it was five total presentations to audiences at uh, the, uh, the Arboretum in Seattle, at Bellevue Botanical Garden, and in an outlying area in the Metta Valley to the east of Seattle. So this is one of the ways that we um, sort of spread the word about the exchange and about environmental ed education and about uh, an example of cooperation between Russia and the US, which is sometimes hard to find these days. So we're very proud of that. In September of this past year, uh, we made a trip to uh, Russia visited all five gardens. So now this is getting to be uh, a little bit more geography involved when we, when we do that. Um, same basic goals of trips over there to do the evaluations and demonstrations, um, participate in workshops and conferences and uh, produce publicity for our exchange. In the um, upper right hand picture, you can see Kate, whom you'll see in a minute. Uh, we, we actually gave, uh, went to a school and gave presentations to kids of various ages. Uh, wonderful experience for us in a small town outside of Vladivostok. In the lower right corner, I just wanted to mention briefly, these are two Russian botanist educators from one from Blagoveshensk and one from Sakhalin. They're making a presentation of a lesson called, um, it's called Ethnobotany. Um, we called it Native Plants and Peoples. It was run at the Arboretum in Seattle. They witnessed it, um, were able to look at the documentation for it, and they saw it actually um, done with kids in the Arboretum in Seattle. They came back to Russia and they developed their own version of it, which is similar in structure, but of course uses native plants and native peoples of Eastern Russia. And a wonderful example of um, how uh, this contact that we have develops into concrete results and an expansion of uh, and enrichment of programs. So that was in Vladivostok at the large conference uh, at the end of our stay in uh, September of 2019. I just put this slide up, uh, Russian newspaper, uh, showing how it works with publicity. The lower picture there has uh, two of our people in it, uh, people from the U.S. talking to one of the Russian teachers. And uh, this is wonderful stuff, um, very positive. And I would mention that in our many travels over there over the last 10 years, we have had really nothing but um, a warm reception and a lot of enthusiasm for what we're doing. This past fall, um, following up on the contacts we made in Warsaw, like I mentioned in 2018, we started the exchange with Ukraine by going to visit three locations um, in Ukraine where there are botanical gardens uh, that we had preliminarily made contact with. Uh, the three locations um, are circled there, Kiev, in the southwest, and Lviv in the far west of the country. So um, that's where Ukraine is, and that's where the Pacific Northwest is, as you probably all know. And Kiev was the first stop, and it's uh, almost 3 million people, by far the largest city in Ukraine, the capital cultural center. They have two fantastic botanical gardens. We're working mainly with what's called the National Botanic Garden in Kiev. And the lower middle picture is, is there. It's sort of above the city on a, on a, on a hill. And uh, on the lower left, you can see that I am giving a lesson in the field to attendees of the seminar we put on. Uh, the reception was very strong. The situation's pretty similar to Russia when we first went there. They're trying, they're doing some environmental education programs, but it's, it's um, 
still at a pretty early stage and they just loved learning more about techniques they could use and the same issue with the volunteers so they hope to increase their volunteer programs. We went on to Kamenets Podilski, a much smaller city in the south, beautiful uh, mountains around, uh, natural areas, and it not only has a botanic garden, but is the headquarters of the largest national park in Ukraine. And so we've been working now with the national park as well as with the botanical garden there. Our last stop was Lviv in the far west, much different uh, culturally, although in the same country, it's more um, got much more Catholic Western influence in it, um, also very rich history and a small botanical garden in the middle of town, which um, three of us are standing in front of in the lower middle shot, and then a much larger beautiful botanical garden out toward the edge of town on, on your lower right. So that was about a that was about a 10 day trip and we signed a protocol with our Ukrainian uh, colleagues uh, and they were supposed to come in March of this year, this spring just now, but of course um, COVID-19 prevented that. So we've postponed their visit to um, tentatively October of this year, but more likely spring of next year. We'll just have to wait and see what happens with the pandemic and its restrictions. So what is the benefit of this exchange? What are the benefits of this exchange? Um, I'll go through these, through these fairly quickly. I've kind of touched on them as we've gone along. New innovative educational programs, expanded volunteer programs, increased contacts and collaboration between environmental educators in partner countries. So in the Pacific Northwest itself, educators have been working together more closely because they've traveled together and teamed up to host the um, visitors. It's also happened between educators in Ukraine and in Eastern Russia, especially. And then, of course, the collaboration across international borders has been very rewarding. Um, in Eastern Russia, where we've been now for 10 years, the uh, gardens are becoming, and in some cases have become already, centers of environmental education. This is very important. So they're reaching out beyond the botanical garden. Um, they're putting on seminars that are attended by teachers, um, administrators of national parks. So there's kind of a spreading ripple effect in each of these five locations to improve and expand environmental education. That's been one of our key goals. This is a little bit more intangible, but uh, the, it's really been um, testified to by Russians, Ukrainians, and US educators that the exchange has provided a lot of personal and professional uh, for their work. Also, I mentioned increased publicity for environmental education, especially in Russia, uh, to some extent in the US as well, and, and now in Ukraine. And last but not least, it's created opportunities to expand and improve education to other locations. We just have gone to Ukraine now, and we hope to go to the Republic of Georgia, and we also met in Warsaw, Botanical Garden representatives next year. We hope to go to Georgia and develop an exchange there. Now that we have a model, a successful, a successful exchange program, it makes it easier to expand it to other places. Challenges. Shortages of one person is never either of those, and I expect that you're probably um, well acquainted with these problems in your own um, work uh, in botanical gardens. You just have to keep finding ways to work around it or work through it. Language and cultural differences. This can lead to accurate precision. So that's something we just need to be sensitized to. Make sure we've got people, language, and cultural capabilities involved in the exchange to help uh, bridge a gap. And then it's a willingness to um, accept and work with uh, new cultures and new ideas, new ways of looking at the world. Scheduling difficulties can come up as people are busy, educators are busy, botanical garden employees are busy. The school year demands um, can be difficult to work around and um, other types of uh, scheduling difficulties, not to mention the most recent ones the, um, related to the pandemic. Bureaucratic uh, inflexibility can be a problem, especially because we are working with often large organizations such as universities or the Academy of Sciences, which uh, runs several of the botanical gardens in 
uh, Russia or governments themselves. And political conflicts uh, can certainly happen. It's been an up and down period with Russia, mostly down lately. So there can be tr problems getting visas or uh, grants because of that. So far, we've been able to go, no, negotiate that quite well. And we've gotten, we have not had a trip canceled because of uh, inability to get visas. And of course, now we have the barrier or the challenge of um, travel restrictions from COVID-19. Um, so we're working with our colleagues now on Zoom, trying to move the exchange forward. Um, we're doing some seminars on Zoom. We're um, meeting to discuss new ideas. And we hope that the travel aspect will uh, resume again in 2021. Plans for 2021 are quite ambitious. Some of these are postponed from 2020, so we actually have five trips. I won't go through them all. You can see them on the screen. But basically, they represent um, an expansion to Ukraine, a continuation with Russia. We are now uh, have a plan to work with Missouri Botanical Garden, which is wonderful. They are interested in hosting a group for a week. So that will be a new step in our, um, in our hosting of Russians and then uh, also exploring with uh, Georgia and working more with Ukraine. That's it for my presentation. Um, thank you very much for your uh, attention. And uh, thanks, I wanna just thank again, all our supporters and collaborators, especially Earth Corps, and the many people and organizations, including homestay hosts, because our visitors stay um, in homes in the Seattle area, which are great partners in Russia and Ukraine. And my email address will be up at the end of the presentation by um, uh, Kate, so uh, you don't need to try to get it down now. Thank you again very much. And I would like to now um, present uh, Svetlana Sizich. About the ecological education at the Botanical Garden of Irkutsk State University. Uh, where is Irkutsk on the map of the world? Uh, Irkutsk uh, is a city located in eastern Siberia in Russia, almost in the middle of uh, our country, in uh, 70 kilometers from the shore of the Lake Baikal. And the Lake Baikal is the largest freshwater lake by volume in the world, and it contains about 22 percent of the world fresh surface, surface water. And uh, the city of Irkutsk is an old and young city. Founded in uh, 1661, Irkutsk is included in the list of historical settlements of Russia. Its population is more than 650,000 people. Our Irkutsk State University was founded uh, in the beginning of the 19th century and now it has more than 18,000 students. Uh, the Botanical Garden of uh, Irkutsk State University was established in 1940 and uh, we have 74 acres uh, inside the city. Uh, and a uh, large collection of plants, numbering about 5,000 species and varieties. And uh, our mission is to preserve the flora of the Lake Baikal region and the world for people through public education, collection, research and conservation of plants. Uh, here in Siberia, we have not only ice and snow, but a lot of nice plants and uh, our main collections is a collection of medicinal plants both native and introduced species the collection of rare and endangered species of plants from a red list of russian federation and from our local red lists uh, we have a pretty big woody plant collection, con contains, of course, the woody plants of the boreal forest, collection of fruit plants, which is favorite, favorite uh, for our visitors. 
uh, and uh, we are proud of our tropical and subtropical plants collection and our perennials and uh, we have some display gardens uh, for example our Korean garden the only one in Russia and uh, our Korean garden was opened uh, with the support of Council General of the Republic of Korea in Irkutsk uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, very uh, proud that, uh, that our sister city Kanin uh, helped us to create this garden our, our medicinal garden, uh, the visitors of uh, the botanical garden love to uh, visit the medicinal garden and uh, we develop the different educational programs are based on these medicinal plants. The programs for university students, of course, for families, for tourists, for gardeners, uh, and it's not only educational program, but some cultural events too. Uh, our Japanese garden is only in Siberia and it was created by our Japanese colleagues from Hokkaido University. Uh, and uh, inside the garden we have the Green Heritage of Hiroshima exposition. Uh, seeds from plants uh, that survived the atomic bombing of Hiroshima have been planted in Irkutsk and both Hiroshima plants and the Japanese garden are perfect storytellers for our visitors. An ecological trail uh, in our forest area demonstrates different types of natural vegetation uh, at Baikal region and uh, tell visitors about native plant species and uh, particularly about our rare plants. Of course all these collections, displays and facilities uh, help us to develop new environmental education programs, to create new uh, exhibits and not only about plants but about uh, some cultural uh, events. Special attention is paid to partnerships with uh, our local community, uh, with schools, with uh, educational and environmental organizations of the Lake Baikal region and not only, uh, but also with other regional, uh, other regions of Russia organizations and our um, international colleagues. Uh, for the past several years, the U.S.-Russia Environmental Education Exchange Program uh, has been successfully implemented uh, and uh, has uh, included walking visits by our garden staff to U.S. organizations in uh, 2017 and 2019. Uh, my colleagues visited educational and environmental organizations that actively conduct programs on environmental education, uh, for example, Earth Corps, Island Wood, uh, and the Bellevue Botanical Garden and other organizations. A new experience was gained in working together with our uh, colleagues. And as a result, uh, in the 
2019 year, the number of visitors increased dramatically by 40 percent in com compared, comparison with uh, 2017. And we developed some new exhibitions, some new guided tours and uh, uh, um, another events at the garden. Uh, family with children uh, are our main audience last years and uh, we are doing experiments uh, on cell biology together with children. Uh, our visitor center has a computer area with microscopes for practical classes uh, with school children uh, and uh, several classes are united by a single theme and are called microcosm. You, uh, the US Russia Environmental Education Exchange Program allowed us to change the approach to education at the Botanical Garden, and now uh, it is new one. It's botanical garden for everyone. Uh, and uh, here you can see our main audiences, like students and young people, school children, families, tourists, gardeners and uh, people for disabilities. The botanical garden conducts tours for for visitors, exhibits, programs for schools, uh, events for different audiences, uh, and some big cultural and environmental events and uh, art classes. And uh, in the botanic garden, the children themselves are looking for answers to questions, are doing their own small research. And uh, during the last two years, uh, we um, are running the summer program for school children, a learning vocation. And uh, this project is a result of adaptation of environmental education programs at U.S. organizations to Irkutsk Botanical Garden opportunities. Uh, five days, five different topics for research. The botanical garden uses uh, an integrated approach to the study of biodiversity and its conservation. Uh, birds, insects and other fauna living in the botanical garden, they are a part of our programs. And uh, children just love to watch, to listen, to touch, so to use all the Sensory, sensory opportunity to discover the nature. Ethnobotanical uh, programs uh, are interesting for visitors and uh, not only for our local community but for tourists too. And the goal of these ethnobotanical programs uh, is to Preserve, preserve the traditions of uh, relationships with nature among our different people, uh, um, such as Buryat people of the Baikal region. Uh, we developed this together with our native Buryat people and together with uh, Irkutsk State University students and teachers of the Buryat language department. Every, every year we develop some new guided tours. Um, for example, poetry, the shady garden, insects around us and others. Some master classes and uh, another educational programs. Uh, 
we develop some cultural events, uh, for example, flowers, stars, and poems at the botanical garden. For example, uh, some uh, last year uh, we've got more than 700 people attended uh, our event just for one night. Uh, some new exhibitions and festival uh, were created uh, last year. Uh, for example, the Evolution Exhibition Project, uh, which introduced the history of the appearance of life on Earth and the evolution of living organisms. And uh, we had a lot of partners for this event. And our main partner was the University Geological Museum. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a very big event in Irkutsk, the festival Ecoflora uh, included many interesting events, uh, not only for professionals, but also for general public. Uh, and uh, we got volunteers last year. Our uh, staff member Jana Markova and now she is a volunteer project coordinator. She visited US organizations in the Seattle area in 2017. And now she's responsible for a new direction for us. Uh, and uh, our new volunteers attended a general orientation to learn about the garden and review specific volunteer service areas. Specific training was offered and required for participation in environmental education programs. The exchange also uh, led to the international conference conducted in Irkutsk in 2019 and to an environmental education seminar in 2019, sorry, yeah. Mm. More than 250 participants took part uh, at the conference and uh, 30 participants at the seminar from different regions of Russia and from the US and from Great Britain. Uh, they represented botanical gardens and environment organizations. Our partners shared their practical experience uh, with each other. On behalf of the Russian Botanical Gardens that participate in the Environmental Exchange Program, I sincerely thank our partners and especially Earthcorp, Seattle and Bellevue Botanical Garden. Uh, we are grateful to Tony Ellison coordinator of International Environmental Exchange uh, Earthcorps for his enthusiasm and uh, continued support of our exchange. And we hope for further cooperation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Svetlana. Okay. So, um, I am Kate Sorensen. I'm from the Bellevue Botanical Garden Society, and uh, we're located in Bellevue, Washington, um, which is uh, close to Seattle, and um, it's about the quarter of the size of Seattle. It's a suburb. Bellevue has a warm, temperate climate. We have cool, wet winters and mild, relatively dry summers. Bellevue is a culturally diverse city and with just over half of its population being of a non-white race or ethnicity and 43% speaking a language other than English at home. The top six languages in Bellevue are English, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, Korean, and Vietnamese.
So here's an overview of our garden. Um, community volunteers worked hard to establish the garden in 1992 as a part of the city of Bellevue Park system. Since then, the garden has grown to encompass 53 acres of cultivated gardens, woodlands, meadows, and wetlands, and is a community treasure for everyone to enjoy in the heart of the city. Each year, close to 400,000 people visit the garden from every corner of the globe. Accessibility is important to us, and there is no admission fee to get into the garden. We differ from the gardens in Vladivostok and in Irkutsk in that we are not associated with the university, and the creation of the garden was driven by the community. There's a 30-year partnership that exists between the City of Bellevue and the Bellevue Botanical Garden Society. The City of Bellevue owns the land the garden is on, and through the Parks and Community Services Department provides management, garden maintenance, about eight staff members, and an operating budget. The nonprofit Bellevue Botanical Garden Society, which is what I'm part of, is responsible for providing educational programs at the garden. There's five paid society staff that work on site, as well as a large group of dedicated volunteers. The garden also has nine other partner groups that share horticulture knowledge and develop and maintain some of the garden's displays. So just to give you an idea of what our garden is like and how um, we all work together, I'll give you a brief tour. As we go, you'll see um, some of the local partner groups and all of their work that has been done at the garden. So at the beginning, visitors are greeted by the streetscape garden along Main Street and at the entry by a water wall. These spaces are designed and they were maintained by the city of Bellevue. We really enjoy walking students through the rock garden. It showcases plants that thrive and lean in rocky soil. It is maintained by members of the North American Rock Garden Society, another one of our partners. The Iris Rain Garden has plants that are adapted to the garden cycles of wet and dry. And we also currently have an Iris Test Garden that has been planted in anticipation of an Iris Convention at the garden in 2021. This is our newest garden. The Urban Meadow was only planted a few years ago. It showcases plants that are pollinator friendly, drought hardy, deer resistant, and low maintenance, and includes a native bee exhibit. Our education center is five years old and has office and multi-use classroom space. Since the classroom space is used by Everybody, by garden partner groups, adults, and children's education programs, all programs have to be portable. Supplies are stored on site and moved in and out of the classrooms. Another partner group, the Northwest Perennial Alliance, has designed, planted, and maintained this perennial border for almost 30 years. In fact, the border is the largest public perennial garden in the U.S. that's maintained entirely by volunteers. Each year, a bed is planted by the Northwest Dahlia Association, and it's a favorite of our visitors when the flowers are in bloom and a great educational tool to talk about flowers and flower parts. The Eastside Fuchsia Society demonstrates for us the beauty of these plants, and many fuchsias are hardy in the Pacific Northwest, and they'll return year after year. The Bellevue Department of Utilities actually runs our WaterWise Garden. It's a demonstration garden that shows to our visitors that it's possible to conserve water, lower chemical use, reduce runoff, recycle materials, and preserve habitat without sacrificing beauty. Cal and Harriet Shorts donated the property that became the Bellevue Botanical Garden, and parts of their original garden still exist today. Our youngest visitors really enjoy visiting the old Ritz cellar door and the fish in the ponds. Designed with a blend of Asian and Pacific Northwest landscape design elements, the Yao Garden honors Bellevue's sister city of Yao, Japan. The two cities recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of this sister city relationship. 
Our original APGA presentation meant to include a discussion of sister city relationships and included a re representative from the city of Portland's sister city department. Portland has many long-term sister city relationships. If you are looking to make international ties, finding out if your city already has those connections to a sister city is a great place to start. The Tateuchi Pavilion shown here was made possible through the generosity of the local Tateuchi Foundation, which seeks to promote and improve international understanding between Japan and the United States. And we are lucky to have them um, contribute to our garden. The Rhododendron Glen and its collection of ferns is maintained by the Hardy Fern Foundation volunteers. And our native discovery garden is tended by volunteers from the Washington Native Plant Society. Beyond the formal gardens, there are trails that take visitors into the forest. The suspension bridge was built to make sure the entire area would be accessible without disturbing the natural topography. This area is great for educational programs. It's a place where the kids can have more freedom to explore without fear of harming any plantings. This is one of our preschool classes inside of an art piece called the Friendship Circle. So that was a brief tour of our garden. Um, next up, how has the Bellevue Botanical Garden been involved with the International Exchange Program that Tony was talking about? So like he said, we have hosted three different groups of staff from Russian Botanical Gardens. We have had great small group discussions about how to recruit volunteers, how to train them, um, guest services, and all of the different children and adult education programs that we offer. And being a botanical gardens and not really a nature center, we were able to speak with them really what it means from a botanical garden point of view to offer these education programs. We have held lectures for the public and our garden membership to learn about the program. Tony has worked with drawing people to the event through the University of Washington's Ellison Center for Russian Studies. And besides spreading the word about the exchange, we also hope through these events to draw people from our local Russian and East European communities to the garden to meet the speakers and to get connected with our volunteer and our educational programs and hopefully help us develop programs that they are interested in doing. We have had some success recently with reaching out to our local Chinese community. We asked how we could be a resource for their community and they suggested Chinese tea classes. It has been a great way to connect through the botany of tea. Through this relationship, they were able to form a new nonprofit, TEA Washington. We were working with them on a Chinese New Year celebration when the COVID crisis started. A good resource for working with community groups is Of By For All, which was started by Nina Simone. Um, they have a, they're a great resource and they take the view that communities should be asked what they need instead of an organization making assumptions about their needs. As part of the city's International Week last year, we had hoped to bring a group of monks from Tibet to do a program with us at the garden, but their visas were denied. One of those problems with international travel that can sometimes happen and that we've been so lucky that Tony's program has had such good luck with visas and getting travelers back and forth. So the Russian educators who have visited the garden have not had an opportunity to observe our children's education classes. We were hoping to do that this past spring with a group visiting from Ukraine. Hopefully we'll be able to do that in the future. In the lower right photo, you can see the, how the web of life game that you saw in both Tony's and Svetlana's presentations is also played here at our garden. The exchange has really helped with the spread of ideas. So last fall, I had the opportunity to go the other way on the exchange and visit Vladivostok and their botanical garden. I was able to attend a botanical conference with educators from all across Russia and botanists. It was exciting to witness how the Russian environmental education leaders were able to come together at the conference. 
as part of the Russian Scientific Academy, like Tony said, they often have the additional pressure of producing scientific publications as well as the running of educational programs. We also met with ed environmental educators to exchange lessons as part of the conference and to do some activities with Russian children. With the adult learners, I shared some of my favorite activities to do with kindergartners. I was using a project learning tree activity about wood and we had a great time learning about tree parts by making a human tree with everybody slurping in Russian and English. Um, and this activity turned around and was being filmed by the local TV station. So hopefully, you know, that helps them get out the idea of environmental education, the importance of it, and maybe some of the activities we shared with them end up in some Russian classrooms. The Russians at the Environmental Education Conference were also interested in learning more about one of our fundraising events at the garden called Garden Delights. They're very interested in how this winter holiday lights display helps to raise money for educational programs. What I've learned and what I have brought home from the experience to going to Vladivostok um, as a direct result of my trip with Exchange, I was working on a Russian language family class with our Russian translate, translator, Ariadna, who happens to live not too far away. And um, we worked together to work up a class for um, those in the area, uh, families who spoke Russian, and you can see on the slide uh, a little bit of the verbiage from our flyer. We had hoped to start kind of an environmental family club similar to one we visited at a school in Russia. The process, um, through the process of organizing the class, I was starting to make connections with a staff member from Belarus and finding ways to connect to Bellevue's Russian population. We also hope to connect with other organizations in our area like the Mountain to Sound Greenway to offer other environmental education opportunities for these families. I probably would not have made the connection with Mountain to Sound if a member of that organization hadn't been on the trip to Russia with me. So not only were we make connections with our Russian colleagues, but also with um, those that are close to us. Oh, sorry. Um, so the Russian translator, Ariadna, was also able to get uh, Russian language copies of this book by Joseph Cornell called Sharing Nature with Children. And, it, and she got it shipped to us. And we could share this environmental education resource directly with the Russian speaking families. So if you're interested in a resource like that, just contact us if you would like to learn more about the book. Another idea that I really liked that was happening in Vladivostok is to join together with other informal education organizations and offer a, a summer passport program to encourage families to visit several educational attractions like the aquarium, the zoo, and the children's museum. Since I already belong to our local museum educators group, this seemed like a very doable idea. So hopefully that will happen in the future. So the exchange really works both ways. I'm so thankful for the partnerships within our garden, for Tony Allison and our international partnerships that support the environment and education of our visitors, and to Earth Corps and the other funders of this exchange. So we hope you enjoyed the presentation and that you're inspired to explore new partnerships, both at home in your community and further abroad internationally all around environmental education. Please contact us, contact us if you have any questions, we would love to hear from you.